So our, our next speaker um, is a, a multiple international athlete in South Africa. She's played sports, uh, various sports for South Africa, multiple years. She's captained um, the South African hockey side. Um, and she's also gone back to, very much like Julian has, has gone back to um, coaching school kids and coaching um, in the school space. So um, welcome, Marcel. Welcome to, um, to our webinar today. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for inviting me. So Marcel's going to be talking about the benefits of playing multiple sports. A lot of kids focus initially on one sport instead of another. So um, as, I say, as I keep on saying, you're not here to talk to, to listen to me. Uh, welcome Marcel and um, I'll let you get the floor. Thanks. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much. I've been um, having a look at all your talks that you've been having, and I think it's absolutely fantastic to um, to grow this learning community. And I mean, you can see by the number of coaches that you've got watching and in tune with all these um, these sessions, how South African sport and South African coaches are very passionate. Um, so I think that's a great start as it is. And um, I think that going back into where I grew up was in East London, same as Julian, which is amazing. And, um, you know, uh, being a small town, I was privileged enough to be able to m do multiple sports all across. And it's actually quite a funny story. So both of my parents um, are teachers. One is a primary school teacher at Selborne Primary. And one was a high school teacher at Hudson Park High. And um, it's quite funny because when we came along, my older sister is two years older than me, Leanne, and then it's me, um, Marcel, and then my younger sister, Samantha. And we actually were born in Bloemfontein, another small town, and then um, my mom and dad moved to East London, and um, so we grew up in East London, and it was, it was absolutely like a mecca for us kids growing up that um, my mom and dad kind of they were sporty themselves. I mean, they crossed over from hockey to water polo to diving to life-saving to, um, I mean, swimming, you can name it. Every sport there was, we were involved in it. And um, I remember my mom telling us a story when we were little that um, people used to laugh at us kid girls because we had so much energy and we were like, we were just going non-stop full of energy and um, even at school you would hear like the normal the um, she's very disruptive at school she doesn't sit still etc etc those normal you know those normal questions that you um, you get asked by the teachers to the parents so so my mom and dad were like this is like in I'm going to give away my age here but like this was in the 90s and um, that's when ADHD wasn't like really massively there. And I don't know if we've, we've never been diagnosed with ADHD, but we were just a bundles of energy. And um, I remember my mom taking us to um, our, our doctor, um, family friends of ours. And he used to say to my mom, Nona, he was like, don't even worry about it, Nona. Just put them on any sports field or any sort of pool or any activity that you can and you'll find out that they'll be absolutely fine and she literally took that very seriously and um, we were we were basically um, like thrown into every sport that you could think of and um, and I think from there we were we were kind of nurtured in our environment at home um, that we were exposed to sport because my parents coached all the sport my dad coached water polo and swimming and he also did um, life saving and um, canoeing and then my mom on the other side she did diving and springboard diving and um, she did she coached hockey too and um, so we were dragged around those fields and those water polo pools and everything all the time so I mean you know it, it was kind of just natural to be able to um, slot into those type of sports and then when we were little also because my mom had get, been given the advice to just go for it that we got involved in as many sports as possible and um, I think that was the foundation for all three sisters of 
um, you know, the, the passion and love for sport, first of all, it came from home, but it also came from the community and being able to, um, you know, get involved in, in, in any sports throughout East London. And, um, you know, that gave us the most amazing foundation for our sport. I mean, it, it, when you have um, key um, movement, um, skills, ball skills, strengthening, um, cardio, all the physical aspects, but also mentally, um, it's, it was absolutely brilliant for us because we were exposed to different coaches. We were exposed to different environments. We were exposed to different competitive levels. We were, you know, it was like... Um, constant just like entertainment and excitement for us to just develop this love that we have for sport and then you know it turned into something hey that we like okay maybe we're quite talented at this and maybe we can you know make a career out of it so um i think doing that it catapulted us in, um, into our senior careers and um the, the three sisters, I mean, my massive role model was my older sister. She's two years older than me. So whatever she did, that's what I wanted her to do. And I followed her. And um, also growing up in East London, you know, everybody knows everybody. So it was also really good to um, have these, these role models that I could look up to and say, hey, I want to I do that. So, um, so that's how we started off our, our careers at a, a very young age. And... Um, I don't know if you want to ask some more questions before I carry on. I'm going into my my senior years. Um, no, nothing at the moment. Uh, you can carry on. It's cool. Thanks. Okay. So so yeah. So that was an amazing foundation. Um, of growth and I can even tell you some stories which are quite like it's quite amusing but that now that I look back it actually makes total sense like you think of like the Serena Williams sisters that are like a young age their dad taking them onto the court for a hundred hours hitting that ball hitting that ball and they were probably just thinking that it was fun but it was like building them for repetition of excellence um so when we were little, um, all three of us, little girls, shame, I think my dad really wanted boys, but <laughs> we were, before every bath time, we were doing, and I mean, we were like five years old, seven years old, you know, like that age, my dad would make us do like sit-ups and push-ups and squats and star jumps before we used to get into the bath. And then, um, you know, we were, like in the Keat household, the activities for the, the weekend would be like a run down to the beach or a, a cycle or like a long swim or climbing to the top of a mountain. And we always used to joke in our family because my dad always used to say on like, on like family holidays, okay, guys, we're going to go for a hike or a walk. And it landed up being like a 21K walk. And this is like my mom with three little girls, like hiking along um, our holidays. So, um, I mean, it just was just instilled in us that, that nature and that, um, that sport and that passion. And um, I think it, it, it stems massively to your support structure and your system that you have at home. And so, um, just one second. So um, once that had all happened as like a youngster, then um, as we, we got older, you know, um, we started to realize, hey, that we can, we actually quite good at this and we got a little bit more competitive and we were never, ever, never, we, not that I can remember, we were never pushed into um, achievements or, or trying to be number one or trying to come first or anything. It, it, it 
for us household, it was just like an, it was an organic, natural thing that we were competitive in our, in our household. So it just filtered into our schooling structure and our provincial structure and whatever we, we, um, you know, launched ourselves into whichever sport it was, the competitive nature just came out naturally without even thinking of it. That's where we wanted to be. That was, that was like embedded in us from like the young age and, and of it, but just for um, a pure desire, like it was just natural. And um, I mean, I remember days when all three of us would um, be on our, on our little grass patch at our house and we were having like one-on-one -on -one hockey games, like intense, serious one-on-one -on -one Keat girls hockey games. And then it crossed over into the water polo pool. And then it crossed over into like swimming races and who can hold their breath the longest, who can, who can dive the first, who can hit the hardest, et cetera, et cetera. And as we got to school, this just was in, in us and um, we just, we just started to, you know, get involved in these sports. And um, again, the community of East London um, was so amazing because, and I, I really, I think that this is a massive thing for coaches to realize that, um, you know, you, you've got to expose kids and allow kids to feel that they, they can cross over to as many things. It's our duty as coaches and as parents to allow kids to pursue um, different pathways for as long as possible. And um, I mean, even if it means taking that, that extra um, back and forth karting going from practice to practice, I mean, that's what my, I remember my mom doing that. Like I would rush from, the swimming pool, quickly pull on my hockey gear and she'd drop me off at the hockey field. And then she'd fetch me from the hockey field and I'd rush off to a ballet lesson, you know? And without her saying, come on, hurry up, you know, you got to do this or, oh, this is such a, a schlep to do this. It was never ever, you know, a moment where it became like a, a, a massive ask from her side. And also my coaches and my um, teachers, they never made it a big thing for me to, um, I, I never once heard my coach saying, oh, she's late again. It was more like, oh, great, she's here. Let's get the, the practice started and come Marcel, come join in and get going. So I think that was very important growing up, being able to cross over from, you know, um, sport to sport. Um, and that's important and that's our duty as coaches and parents to do that for, for kids, you know. They might not be talented at one sport, but they might absolutely like love that sport. And they might be talented in another, but really struggling at the um, dynamics of that sport. But that's why it's so important for them to pursue both of them, where they learn different things from those sports. So then from that career, um, from that way, we went into our provincial teams and um, obviously following in the footsteps of my sister, you know, she excelled and she made the, um, the SA junior hockey, SA under 18 hockey, and she made um, the SA water polo and, you know, being surrounded by some role models in my school and my peers, that's what I wanted to do. And, you know, I, I really wanted to, to, you know, push hard to, to be like my sister, like my peers around me. And, um, and, and then before I knew it, once you were, once I had worked myself into the system and coming from East London was kind of hard to, um, being from border schools, uh, we were either in the B section or working way into the A section and very unknown and love of the game and surrounded by really good people. And once I had made my first SA under 16 B team when I was in um, grade nine, that was it. I wanted more. I wanted to be in the system. This is for hockey. I wanted to be in the system. I wanted to stay in the system. It became a hockey family for me. 
and I wanted more and more and I wanted to train for it and be, you know, was, was um, always encouraged by my parents to make sure that I stay fit, stay strong, um, keep like in, inspired to go further and further in my career. And um, water polo came very late in East London. I remember my sister actually, she wanted it to start at our, our, our school girl, um, Clarendon. It, it started very late at then. But if she started it, then I was in. And I remember we used to do swimming and we were up and down the pools and up and down the pools. And, and we would always stop at the one place at the swimming pool because you could look over to the water polo pool and we'd like look and we'd be like, oh my word, we want to play with the boys. We want to go play at the water polo. And that's when we were like, Leanne, my older sister was like, okay, we've got to get it started at Clarendon. And it started and I joined in with her and then and then the ball got rolling um, provincial teams and you know luckily we were fortunate to make the national teams and then that's where it happened and that's how things took off in that way and um yeah from starting off the national um national senior program um i think was 2005 for both um water polo and hockey and then, yeah, it's been a, it was a, a roller coaster up and down, constant roller coaster up and down. And, um, you know, that there were some good times. That, uh, because as part of like your family and you're born to do all of that so yeah um sorry Marcel, you yeah. just stuck in the last like um uh, a minute or so so we we missed that last little bit that you're talking about so uh, what i was saying is that um coming into the national into like the senior nationals from like 2005 for water polo and hockey that um once you, you are invested in that, it becomes part of who you are and it becomes part of like your family and your growth. And you just, you want to be in that moment for longer and try harder and um, stay, stay um, invested in there and um, do whatever you can to stay around your like your family because they, they very, they very much become like part of your family. Thanks. That time we got very we got big a part of who Thanks. you are. <laughs> okay, yeah. good, good. But yeah, Sean, we can um, open up if you so want to um, ask. Some the first question that uh, was also asked to Julian um, earlier on, and um, that is, do you, it was actually asked from um, somebody from Sundowns themselves, um, and they asked about um, age cheating in um, in uh, both hockey and in water polo, do you have that problem? Uh, um, I'd say, off. I'd say not too much in in hockey or water polo. I must say that the systems that um, that are in place for hockey and water polo are are quite jacked up, you know, and. Um, I've never had, a, I've never heard of a, a case where there's been age cheating or never, never really seen a case of age cheating or things that there have been situations where, you know, the, at school because they've stayed back a year or two. And, um, you know what, my, my feeling about it is, you know, you know, let, let the kids play, let the, this is their only platform. If they're at a high school, let them play. I understand it's different for maybe cricket and rugby because then there's a big um, physical advantage for boys and um, in, in that situation. So I understand that it might be different then, but in a situation where it's um, for girls and they've been, they've, had to stay back a year then my feeling is you know you have to let the children play 
where else are they going to get that exposure and um, play in the schools? And I've always felt that if this kid is maybe a year older and is like absolutely brilliant player and is just dominating the whole scene, then I understand that's a big problem. But in a team environment and a team structure, when you're playing against better players, you're going to make your teams better. You're going to make your players better. That there's a leading player. Bianca was, um, she was maybe an absolutely incredible player. But what she brought or to the Eastern Cape and to East Valuable. So she's surrounding um, the, the players that are surrounding her are feeding off her and learning from her. And if you can't, you can't buy that from, a, from that is just, um, for me, I always look at it in a positive. I, I can understand why people would see it from like a rugby and a cricket perspective as it being a bit, um, you know, uh, gaining a bit of more advantage. But for me, I think if um, the players giving back, if the players, um, you know, helping in that um, structure and that league in helping, the kid must play. That's that's my feeling. Um, there's also in some of the tournaments that, that we have, there's, um, there is an age limit on the tournament and there's a financial um, in, implication of one of these kind of players of winning the tournament. So sometimes they do push in a, a player that's a little bit old, especially in the football space, to, um, you know, win the money in a tournament. I mean, if you look at the Cameron Tepe Schools Cup, the winning team gets a million rand. So it's yeah. it's quite a big incentive for some teams to win it. Absolutely. And I, and I totally understand that and I get it. And um, I think that the systems need to be, they need to cater for, for those those cases. They need to be jacked up. They need to um, monitor that well. And um, I, yeah, I really, I'm not a fan of cheating. Um, um, and I really think that, like you said, the structures in hockey and water polo are constantly monitored. There's a certain age limit. There's a certain, you know, bracket and they all get checked and everything like that. There is no monetary in, um, hockey and water polo. So that might make things um, a little bit different. But um, I think that that in problems like your soccer and your cricket and, and your, um, your rugby is that they must cater for them that are those ages and then make it competitive under 20 so that those kids can then focus into that age group instead of them having to cheat the way into the under 18 group. So um, th I, that's how I feel maybe the problem could maybe be, you know, solved. Now you, you're quite passionate about the, the idea of playing multiple sports. And I was talking to one of our, our speakers on the 19th is going to be Zanella Mdodana from um, uh, the netball side. And she, she told me a story about um, that she was called, and I think it was when John Mitchell was coaching um, at the Kings. And she was called to go and assist these guys by t t getting them to play netball to help them with the hand, their, their ball skills. So um, can you talk to, to us a bit about the importance um, that you find in playing multiple sports? Oh, I think that that is absolutely so awesome. And the fact that, um, that John Mitchell got a netballer into rugby is just that that's the path that we need to go as coaches. So um, if I think of, for me personally, in my experience as I um, grew up, um, like I said, I was exposed to multiple. So the fundamentals were important. Like swimming was obviously massively important to develop. And then I, my family was so passionate about making sure that we were fit and running fit and running strong. So cross country and um, athletics and life saving on the beach and all of that. And then that crossed over into the hockey. And then, then you take it even like further, which I, I'm not sure too sure if my, if my parents knew this, but like my mom made sure I did 
um, springboard diving. And I also did ballet. A lot of people don't know this, but I did ballet up until matric. And um, doing the ballet and the diving, that's your flexibility, your core, your um, making sure that those muscles are totally conditioned in the aspects. So then you, then you don't really prolong your you in so many ways. And then not only that was like, um, you know, my older sister, she did surfing and I did life-saving. So you're developing like a lot of upper body strength and um, that is crossing over into the strength you need for hockey, the strength you need for water polo. And then if I look at the two sports that I, I did play, the hockey and the water polo, the, um, the water polo strength in the pool obviously crossed over into um, the hockey, being able to be... Um, you know, strong upper bit. So I absolutely, um, I love the fact that, and uh, I really encourage more coaches to, you know, get kids crossing over from multiple sports to just, um, not. it's not only like a physical thing, it's also um, intricate things. So mentally and, um, and like for the rugby guys getting the netball in, it's, um, it's footwork, it's um, ball hand eye. It's, um, it's just, it's, it's really, it's brilliant to be able to just expand all the aspects of their sport in, in all ways possible. I think that one of the things that you spoke about was the, the fun aspect of um, that your parents try to instill in you is that just have fun and play multiple sports. You, I mean, a lot of that time you were just playing just to have fun. You weren't thinking about, well, this is going to benefit that at the end of the day. Yeah. We oh, you froze. Definitely, um, we were lucky to all the sports possible, and um, I I'd actually love to have a sit down discussion with them and to see if they had, they were very specific about what we were doing. But um, I think it was it was really just um, we were just lucky enough that East London was small enough that we could do as many sports as possible. But um, I think it also and it's something that I would like to do with my son is that. Um, I want to encourage him to do as many sports as possible so that he decides which path he wants to go to too, so that he's not forced into it because then you develop a real passion for what you're doing and a real love for what you're doing instead of having to be, um, you know, forced into be something that you are talented at. Now, um, I mean, at the moment, you're involved in so many things. So you, you coach at a primary school, you've got your own, um, uh, what's it, two academies between the water polo and the, the hockey side, plus you're involved in, in so what, what are you all up to and how do you jungle, uh, jug, <laughs> juggle all of that with um, also the family life and everything? So um, I think I'm like conditioned now to knowing that busy is good. <laughs> So if I'm not busy, like with the COVID situation, I've never been for. I've actually even I've st and it's been being able to to be involved with as much as possible is part of my nature, and um, it keeps me on my toes. It keeps me happy, and again, it boils down to your support structure too. So um, my mom and I own the swim school. She is the head honcho at the swim school. She is the absolute legend. She does everything there. And the swim school would not be anything without, without her. And um, then the, the sport, that, that is just, um, we are lucky enough that still in South Africa, we are quite seasonal. So 
water polo, you know, does happen in the summer seasons, overlapping a little bit into the, the hockey seasons. But, um, you know, they, we still have our seasons where it's hockey and water polo. So I can still manage in those ways. And um, otherwise, I just make it work and, and I do what I can and, um, you know, have to sacrifice the rest. But um, I've also got an amazing family. So unfortunately, my, little, my, my son Morgan gets dragged around everywhere with me. <laughs> he doesn't have a choice. So, um, and my, my family too are, I think I, we still make every tournament a family gathering. It's part of like who we are as a family. And if we have like a tournament in Joburg, then my parents will come down because they either want to watch or they want to look after the grandkids or my sister's there. She's playing or refing, both sisters. So it's, it's um, again, we just, we, do, we make it work. And um, it's part of our life. It's part of who we are. And um, I think that's really important. Well, Julian was actually telling me that you still um, consult for also the national sites. Is that true? Yeah, so um, I'm working with the SA ladies team. I'm a selector for the ladies, but I'm also a trainer. So I'm also coaching with the ladies team. And then I'm, I'm also involved with the under 21 group, the, the girls under 21. So they'll have their Junior World Cup next year. So I'm also a coach for that. And then I'm the head coach for the under 18 girls hockey team. Um, so, so I really couldn't get away from my hockey career. So I just launched myself into the coaching world. <laughs> and um, I'm actually very, I was saying to you, career and in your life, it's actually, it's really hard to step away from it as, um, as like an athlete. So when you finish your career, it's, um, it's really difficult to like think about who you are, what is your goal now, what to do. And um, I actually was very lucky that I had some mentors that kind of just like forced me into the coaching world before I even knew it. And I was just, obviously I have a massive passion, passion for helping people and for um, the sport itself. So it was like a natural progression into the coaching world and um, just being able to give back to the sport that gave me so much is, is just, it's been, it's been great. And I love staying busy and it's still part of my family, if you know what I mean. So uh, you know, like a you know. Would you maybe attribute some of that, um, the, the fact that it's still such a passion with you is that maybe there's not as much money involved in, in hockey and, and water polo because like a footballer, they might st stop playing, but got, the, the motivation eventually becomes maybe a bit behind the um, financial side compared to you, which is just passion. You have to pay for your way to get everywhere. Yeah, and I think that's, that is something that's super still about and our country um, hockey is that every that is involved like you said there's no monetary there's no like financial um, support and structure that you you're working with so um, I think that's why my dad always wanted me to be a rugby player because then maybe with my career I would have actually <laughs> developed a good financial structure but that's the that is the beauty of and when you meet more hockey players like like you guys have met Jules you really find out that um when you stand up there and you're singing for your country it is passing on there's no getting paid for it are really just um, patriotic to your kind of teammates um and that's why it's such a special sport, um, water polo and hockey, that you, you really are playing for the passion of it and for the love of the game. And um, I think that's, and I'm hoping that the way of our sport will go financially one day and um, so that people can turn it into um, a career path because I think the South Africans, we're so talented. I mean, imagine adding some... Um, salaries to 
to people that already absolutely have this and their passion and they're giving so much of it, I think you know, the combination would be unstoppable. What is it like when you, you go to a water polo tournament and there's a Spain or a Hungary or a Slovenia or something like that and they've got huge amounts of money chucked in at them and you guys have paid your own way to get there and I mean, those ladies are, are machines. They, they, they're unstoppable. What's it like to come against a team like that? And it's not easy. Oh man, you know what? It's actually quite awesome. I'm sitting here with my friend. She's Megan Schooling. She's played since she was like 15 years old for South Africa. And um, we were chatting about this the other day. And um, it's, such a, it's such an honor to play for South Africa, first of all. It really is. Um, we have got some really talented humans in our country. And I'm just thinking about like for water polo aspect now. And, um, you know, we, we're really passionate about our sport, but also like really proud to be playing for South Africa. And then you get to the big world stage. And, um, and then you're looking around at these professional athletes. They 100% professional athletes in all aspect level paid at the club level. Um, um, most of our team are probably students or teachers or, you know, we still have our, our other jobs. But when you step onto that, um, that world stage and you are there and you've been given the opportunity to be there to play against some of the best, things get put into perspective, you know, and um, in like a competitive way, we've got to, you know, you've really got to take a step back and say, guys, you know, they are professionals. This is what they do. Um, this is what they train for. Every single day, they get paid to do this. And then you got to take a step back and look at us. And like, um, we are in a non-professional. We do not get paid. We train our asses off when we can, okay? And we're super talented. And we come from an incredible country. And we are privileged to be at this tournament that we're playing against. And there are little moments where we are up against them. And there's certain moments because they train all the together. And, um, you know, you just got to take it with like a pound of salt and realize what it is. Um, especially at school level, um, some, of the, some of the teams that go overseas, they... You, you have to leave kids behind, unfortunately, well, from what I understand, because they can't actually afford to pay their, their way there. I mean, how much talent have, have we actually missed out, especially from kids that are from like underprivileged backgrounds that have got all the talent and the strength, but they just can't make that step because they can't afford it? Yeah. So that is unfortunately, I mean, that, that's the, the massive thing about it is that we do lose those players and we do lose them like maybe already from, from like a school because they know that it's, it's going to be a financial burden. So maybe they'll rather concentrate on this. There's no STEM, whereas their career will start. It really is. But um, from, from what I see, um, from what I see in the, the sporting world and in the, the world of, of our hockey and, and water polo is that we, we do try to help out um, in, in ways that we can and our federation helps out as much as we can, but we desperately are in need of, of big sponsors and of, um, you know, markets, you know, people to market us and, um, you, the, hockey is huge and water polo is a massive growing sport. We just need to break that mold and get, get um, a financial sponsor in. And, you know, we don't want to lose those talented players because of a financial burden. But unfortunately, that is what is happening um, at the moment. And that's the path that some players have to make the decision of. And... Um, we have to find a solution to, to get those players in and get them back and, and help out as, as much as we can. But that is the sad situation. Okay. Um, 
Julian could only think of one player, but um, have you seen any players that have gone on to play for South African players in water polo or hockey that have gone on to play for other countries? Um, and it's probably the, 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 the whole thing is that they're going to a professional league overseas. They got into that league, they're nationalized in that country, and they've ended up playing with that country. Have you seen any players like that? Or he could only think of one person that played for Canada. Uh, who, who did Jules think of that? Yeah. So, um, so I'd say um, there was the, the three people that I know of personally. There was Mar Marilyn Agliotti. She was a South African, and then she played for the Dutch ladies team. Um, there was Louisa Moore, who was like a very close friend of mine, and she went and played for the Irish team. Um, there was also... I'm trying to think there was, there, there aren't too many of, I think it's because we are so, um, we're so proudly South African that it's really hard to give up our heritage. I mean, it's like, it's something so special that like, like, I mean, maybe, um, it might be changing now. There's, a, there's loads of girls that have gone over to the States to play in the States. And, um, you know, it's, it's a little bit different to the other sports, you know, but at the end of the day, I think it's a, something that's um, in, I see here, they said Sarah Harris. Yeah, I, so Sarah Harris did go over to um, America and then she went over to Australia and she made the Australian squad. So yeah, thank you. That was, yeah, that's a good one. Um, but, then, then Sarah came back. She came back to South Africa and she, she started coaching South Africa. Um, and so that, that's something that's like embedded in us in, as South Africans. That like, it just, it, it's really hard to give that. And then um, outside of that side, now back to the coaching side directly. Um, how are you coping with lockdown and are you continue to go, you know, with your, with your two academies, are you continuing to see training the kids and how are you, how, how are you coping with that? Oh, I think uh, I, I won't lie to you. I'm very over coronavirus and COVID on a sporting front. It's, it's, it's been, it's been very tough, but um, the one positive thing that I can take away is that it's really instilled a massive want and need and passion for next year. So when we step onto the field, I think people are going to really appreciate being back there. And it's going to mean so much that those little things that we took for granted, like that like extra run you had to do or that extra session you had to put in, we're really going to appreciate every single moment. So that's one thing that I've accepted that will come from it. But um, from, a, from a national point of view, um, we, I have continued with the S under 18s and S under 17s. We've had like a, from, I'd say, April to September, we've had um, every week, we've had online sessions, Zoom sessions, technical aspects, um, you know, mental aspects. So we've been in touch with these girls and um, just trying to, as much as, we don't get the opportunity to be with them physically to do all of this game plans and technical um, X's and O's and situations. So it's actually quite nice that we've been able to have this, this Zoom opportunity with them to, to talk on a technical level with the, this group. Um, just not, unfortunately, physically they can't play and stuff, but I think we've gotten a, a lot covered with this group and I think it's, it's been absolutely amazing. Um, the national ladies have been um, catching up every um, every month, just checking in, talking Tokyo, talking how they're feeling, how they're going. They've had a training program throughout the lockdown, and they've been doing that. Um, and then for the um, – unfortunately, um, I've been doing online sessions like every now and then, but um, – not too many people have bought into the online sessions as in like skill sessions. So um, we do what we can. And um, I've been chatting to a lot of people and been doing a lot of zoom sessions and it's been more a motivational um, coming across more motivationally than actually 
delivering like skill sessions and things like that. So, yeah. You've brought up something interesting that um, because of lockdown, you you can't go out and train. So people get caught up in the actual training part of it. But now you've got an opportunity to sit down and look at the structures and look at and redesign all those kind of things. How, how, how much, well, you've already spoke about doing the, the, the strategy side of it, but how much has been done from a national level? Because you've got a chance to do something that you couldn't do before. Yeah, so like a lot. That's what I've been pretty much busy with, like, um, you know, it's, it's been amazing working with the, um, the SAS HOP team. So that's the, the junior program. So the, the schools level program. And we actually sat down as a body and thought, okay, what are the main fundamentals we want to get through to the national program? What we want to all be on the same page. We want to be, um, you know, um, feeding off to all the ages the same structures and the same progress so that when they step into a national program, they know what we're talking about when we're talking a press or a, um, an outlet or we're talking the terminology. So that has been, that's been massive. We, uh, that's been absolutely amazing for me too, because we've never had a program like this where we've had time to, to talk structures. We've always just gathered up on our uh, um, once off a okay, camp, just <laughs> this is my that's been very patient. Yeah, the structure and chatting tactics has also empowered the the players too. You know, we've made them lead the the conversations, lead the um, talks, and got them thinking hockey. So. I'm really excited to see how this progresses onto the field from what they've learned. And how do you filter that down to the schools? So now that we have, um, it's almost like a, a massive file storage, like all the PowerPoints, all the clips, all the, the input that we've been given. We've got this massive file storage now and um, have a, it's an app at the moment. It's called Coach Logic. So all the coaches in the high performance setups around South Africa have access to this Coach Logic app, and um, so they can all go in and check out the information on this that to their HP, their HP level, their high performance level. Sorry, you, you froze through, you just thought of talking about the app and then the, the rest of it all froze. Sorry. Oh, okay. So no, so we've got a coach, uh, it's called Coach Logic, the app, and it's, um, it, it's accessible to all the high performance coaches in the regions around South Africa. So all the coaches from all the regions in South Africa can, can access all that knowledge and all that information and all the PowerPoints and clips, etc. And they can, when they filter that into their province, into the high, high performance province, then hopefully that filters down into the coaches and the players. That's what we, that's, that's what we would like. Got a quick um, water polo question from some of the coaches, from one of the coaches, and they wanted to know how well does South Africa fare against the um, the more professional countries at at water polo? So um, it's a constant struggle because um, the top countries they are always. They're always at the top edge. You know, they're playing against each other constantly. So I'd say the top eight countries are truly far above us. And they, they keep climbing because of their exposure to competitive um, games and professional nature and their training programs, etc. Then there's like the, the middle eight. It's um, professional at what we are. So um, I'd say at, at that. 
if you, you like islands, Australia's, Canada, semi-professional still, your top countries are your USA's and your Hungary's and your Spain and your Greece and those countries. And um, I'd say that we are just below the bottom middle eight because um, we are talented and we physically, we physically quite strong and fit. So we will last in battles for so long, but then the professionalism really kicks in with um, the, the, training programs throughout the, the year and um, being able to train all the time. So that lets us down a lot. So I'd say when we go to tournaments where you're playing against like um, Czechoslovakia and Ireland and um, that bottom section, we are on top of that, those countries. And that's, I think, just because we are maybe um, physically more, um, we, we're stronger and fitter and um, we're just South African. <laughs> but then as soon as we step into that, that semi-professional league, we do battle. I mean, we can go a good battle against the Canadians and the, the Kiwis and the, um, yeah, the Australians are professional. So we're still far behind them, but we still get let down and we will get beaten by... Um, like a big number we could keep up with them for a chakra one and a chakra two but then by chakra three and four you can see where the professionalism kicks in i have a question here how how has your uh, playing sport benefited your, your your life in general like life lessons that you've learned oh my word M massively absolutely massively i, I think that um I was actually talking about this the other day that some of the things that I had to deal with in my sporting world, the disappointments, the, the trainings, the, the dark places that I've had to be in for, for my sporting world. I mean, nothing compares to that. And um, it only has made me so much stronger and more positive in my personal life. And um, I've used so many lessons in that um, going through my sport and it makes me you know, take the challenges of personal life and a little bit gritty like tactically um, you know think of or so it's been it, it is part of my life I've, I've become part of my life and it's, it's very, very much. How much so? Oh. I got, I got bumped off there for a second. <laughs> yeah, about the last minute of your, your chat about your personal, about the personal life and how it's affected you, we, we missed that whole bit. Um. So I was just saying how I was just saying how it, it, it actually is it is a part of me. Um, I mean, I've been doing this from I'd say 2002 to 2018. So it's a massive chunk of my life, and um, it really be becomes part of who I am, and it. Um, it's definitely developed my resilience, you know, my grit in the world, um, my positive outlook. And it's, re it's really shaped the person that, you know, I want to become and want to be. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for assisting us today and chatting to our coaches today. Thank you very much. And um, Thank you for having me. And, and thank you for the coaches that are invested in their coaching and living listening to other people. I think it's amazing. And feel free to contact me if there's anything that you ask for anything. I really don't mind. Perfect. Thank you so much. And enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Um, not being on the sports field, I'm sure you're going to have, still have quite an active day um, running around with your little one and um, family. <laughs> it's 